Hello and welcome to another radioactive episode of Kitchen Party. It sounds it doesn't sound mildly scientific. Like there was supposed to be theme music. We were supposed to be dancing. Then we were supposed to be drinking. There was a plan. There was an agenda. But I'm sorry. I want to apologize in advance to everyone who expected dancing, who expected alcohol and mayhem and playfulness. And I'm sorry. We could do dancing. We could still do dancing. It's never too Listen, late for dancing. I always assume, Renee, that you were dancing in your heart anyway. So. Um, anyway, welcome to uh, another edition of Kitchen Party. My name is Jeff Houck. I'm the food writer for the Tampa Tribune and blogger at TBO.com. Uh, we, uh, we are here for another rousing Thursday evening on the, uh, on the Google Plus Hangout. And uh, with me, as always, is Renee Lynch. Renee, please introduce yourself. I'm Renee Lynch with the LA Times. And uh, since Babette is not with us today, I'm going to be the one doing the hands and the jazz hands and all that other stuff, okay? Okay. You have a responsibility to pick up Babette Slack, which means about a third of the way in, you start slurring your words from whiskey and or any other spirit. I'm and ready. and I'll take over the whole mispronouncing of name things because I'm really good at that. You got it. And but yeah, you have to do this, and then at about 35 minutes after, uh, a cat will run across your shoulders, and then you have to pet it. I hope <laughs> not. Okay. <laughs> it's just a thing that we have. It's a tradition. It's like um, the green monster at Fenway Park, or uh, you know, terrorism in the Middle East. I don't know. Anyway. Let's get the show started. We have with us as a guest, Kathy Burrow, who is better known online as Mrs. Wheelbarrow. Did I get that right, Kathy? You did. Why am I shouting? I don't know. Who is that grumpy man behind you in the photo? Isn't that wonderful? I sat here intentionally. I've just traveled to Martha's Vineyard to one of my favorite homes ever that belongs to a friend of mine. And this, I think, is a relative of hers. It's kind of creepy, isn't he? Now, when you get um, off the ferry at uh, Martha, Martha's Vineyard, do they Math. give you a shirt that says Vineyard on it? Yes, or? absolutely. You are rep <laughs> I believe they call that representing. That's exactly what I said. I am so wait, let me get this straight. You went to a friend's house as a guest and you stole a painting? Yes. No, no. I'm, in, I'm on Martha's Vineyard right now. I drove oh, here you're from, there now. <laughs> yeah. I drove here from Washington, D.C. this morning. So that was about a 12-hour drive. But I'm very perky. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> well, and I, I just want to announce for everybody that, uh, that Kathy is here despite a, uh, a heroic dose of laryngitis and, uh, yes. and some sort of tropical vineyard, um, you know, uh, laryngitis that nobody's ever diagnosed before. But thank ever. you for being here despite your, uh, despite your malady. I, I feel great. I just don't have any voice, but I have a lot great. of spirit. <laughs> you look great. You've got the cool uh, scarf thing on and the grumpy yeah, hand yeah. on the back, so that, that compensates exactly. for a lot. I worked on this whole set. <laughs> <laughs> there are other gonna, paintings around the room. I'm going to have to start working on my backdrop here because all I have is like the alphabet sign, and, yeah. uh, and that's it. You're really going to um, have to work on that. Yeah, me too. I need, I need to work on a backdrop. <laughs> So anyway, the show tonight is going to be about canning, and we'll we'll definitely take your uh, questions. You can either log them on the Kitchen Party hashtag on Twitter. Uh, we'll be monitoring there, or leave them in the uh, in the chat room and the uh, on Google um, in the in the video hangout thingy that I know all the technical words for. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk fall canning ideas, and and Kathy, I have to think that this is the start of the high holy days of of canning. Am I wrong about that? It's actually, we're, we're running into the end of the High Holy Days. That's what I meant. <clears throat> yes. It really ramps up around May with strawberries. Okay. And then um, reaches a, a peak with tomatoes in okay. August. And now we're kind of sliding back, quieting down. We got chilies, we got grapes, we got apples, and then we're all going to put our stuff away. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, what are you drinking? Tonight. I am drinking a Negroni made Ooh. with, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, C-Y-N-A-R. Is that Chinar or Sinar? Anyway, yes. yes. I made it with that instead of Chinzano. In honor, of the, in honor of the painting behind you, we're going to call it a Negrumpy. Okay. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cheers, Negrumpies. Cheers. Oh, and Renee, Renee what are you drinking? And cheers. I have some white wine. Okay. Oh, and you're, you're drinking it out of the skin-free glass. I like I, those. You know why I love these glasses? Because, seriously, if you invited me to your house for dinner and you gave me wine in a glass with a stem, there's like a 90% chance that I would eventually break it. So 
a friend oh, bought me a case of like not stemless glasses, and so far I haven't broken any of them. So I call them nice. low lying wine glasses. They're just Ooh, like, like low, that. right? They just stay there. Yeah. I call them Renee proof glasses, but I like low lying better. <laughs> Renee's a big fan of fingerprints on glassware, so she likes the without the stems. I, I've, I've seen stylists who do that just like intentionally. <laughs> Well, I'm representing Tampa with another stellar can of Cigar City Maduro beer uh, brewed here in Tampa, Florida, and um, I, I enjoy it mightily. So that's where I'm That's where I'm at. I don't drink anything from the vineyard or from a vineyard. I drink it from, <laughs> I drink it from Harvest Time. So anyway, so, so let's talk about this. What, uh, what is it that you, uh, what is it that you most like to can or preserve? What is your favorite thing to do that, that people respond to really well? Well, I um I have a pretty big preserving program at home. I, it's funny to call it a program, but I try my best to support the local farmers by preserving everything all summer and then eating that all winter. Okay. So, um, probably the most important product that's in my pantry are tomatoes because I use those all the time. Right. But the things that I'm really proud of are oil cured tuna fish or duck confit or jars of fresh black beans that I can so that they're ready. So these are real grocery items that I'm replacing in the in my own pantry. I mean the duck might not be, but the rest of it. Um, and I'm trying my best not to buy those foods um, in the grocery store, but put them in the pantry myself. And it makes a big difference. My summertime food costs might be a little higher, but all winter we're just eating out of the pantry. I see. So I also do charcuterie and cheese making as well as fermenting and some other preserving techniques but the combination of canning fresh vegetables and fruits putting some things up through pressure canning meats fish and beans and then adding charcuterie and cheese means I pretty much can um, feed the whole household but with foods that I make myself. Wow that's amazing. Now, see, I got that wrong. Where I said it was the high holy days, I was I was thinking of Australia. See, we have a, we have a, we have a viewer. Yeah, I knew I knew I was right somewhere in the world. Fiona Absolutely. Ryan, Fiona Ryan on Google Plus says that strawberries at their peak right now in Australia, right. and she's looking for preserve uh, preserving suggestions other than jam. Other than jam, well, you can pickle strawberries. They're really quite good. Um, they can be used the same way that you might use chutney. Mm -hmm. But I I also I think that strawberry booze is kind of fun. So you just put some strawberries in a jar and cover it with vodka and add some sugar and let it hang out for a while. Maybe a vanilla bean, star anise, a cinnamon stick, anything. Okay. Um, oddly, most liquors like that are fermented for 40 days. I don't get it, but it's 40 days no matter who you talk to. The French, the Italian, the Germans, whatever they're doing, they put fruit, liquor, sugar in a jar, and it takes 40 days to make into liquor. That's good. So that's I'm all funny. in favor. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have the willpower, but sure, you know, 40 days, why not? <laughs> Just put it in a closet and write it on a calendar, or else 65 <laughs> days later you go, where, what's the, where is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, how I did you get, how did you, oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Renee, what? I love those suggestions. They're, they're offbeat. I want to just give a shout out to some folks that are jo joining us on Twitter. Um, and if you have any questions for Kathy, please uh, tweet them as you can tweet them if you want to using the kitchen party hashtag. Of course, Dash for Foodie is in the house. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, Generation Food Truck asks, Jeff, why are you so awesome? That's a great question. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, uh, and thank you for that wonderful question. I think it's the best question that's ever been asked on Kitchen ever. Party. But what I would say is, um, because I use canning and preserving methods that prolong and stretch out the supply of awesome, I don't necessarily have more awesome than anybody else. I just conserve it better, and then I can pass it along to other people, and they can make their own awesome. I'm pretty sure you've got lots of awesome. Uh, well, also yeah. uh, joining us, uh, Roberta Romero. Thank you, for Roberta, for giving us a shout-out. Um, and uh, uh, Nicole Dash of Court, a Dash of Dork. Oh, I love that. I love that handle, Nicole Shabbat. Thanks very much for, for uh, giving us a shout-out about tonight's party. Um, and don't forget, tweet us any questions, and I will be monitoring that for us. Oh, and uh, Helene of La Cuisine. Helene, yeah. thanks for joining us. She says, I was picking apples at an orchard 
and they were made with and made them with beets and apples. Or, or I'm sorry, made them with made a jam with beets and apples. It was so good. That's a great suggestion. Huh? That's a really nice suggestion. So tell me a little bit about how you got started and what what was it that kind of uh, made you passionate about this kind of thing. Uh, well, I started canning as a small child with my grandmother and my great grandmother. My mom and I canned. I mean, like most, many. Is that me? No. <laughs> me. Um, and I think that a lot of people who can now started with their families. But um, for many people, canning has become more important as sustainability has become important and local food eating, and, and that's when it started to come to the forefront. I read um, Barbara Kingsolver's book, Animal Vegetable Miracle, mm -hmm. and I think that that for me was a, um, a decisive moment. It explained to me how I could take things that felt important, like eating locally and supporting local farmers and being involved in the, econ the agricultural economy of my general region, but to do it in a meaningful way at home meant preserving those foods that all of those fantastic farmers are growing and actually eating them all year. Because it's very convenient to be a local eater in the summer. It's, it's not so convenient in the winter. Sure. Um, and then, so when you decided to get into it, what, what, how did you learn how to do it? What were the ways that you figured it out? Well, I already had, had done it a lot as a kid. And then... Um, I guess my interest grew. I, I, the Internet's an amazing place. I mean, the USDA has a lot of information. The um, company that owns bald canning jars, that's Jarden Home Products, they have a whole online site with, that's full of information. And so does the University of Georgia. They have the National Center for Home Food Preservation. And right. that is just a, a rock-solid source of information. So that was where I started, and I've talked to a lot of canners, and I've done a lot of experimenting. I've had recipes tested by um, independent testing agencies to make sure they were safe, and I'm really fortunate I have this terrific book deal with Norton, and that'll be coming out in a year. So I've been working a lot on this. And then you started the blog how long ago? 2009, was it? Yeah, three, four years ago, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and what have you found in terms of how uh, how popular it is online? I mean, I know the the internet's great for everybody huddling about their <laughs> little their little fires, but um, I found a very vibrant canning and preserving community on there. Uh, and when I started doing it a couple of years ago for a story I was doing, it was amazing to me how many people were out there to kind of help you along. Very much so, um, Kim uh, um, Kim O'Donnell out in Seattle started canning across America with Jean Sauvage about four years ago, and that got all these canvolutions started, and there were annual canning days and canning parties. So I saw all that happening sort of at the same time that I started my blog, which was, it was a, um, a lark. I mean, I started this thing not because I had any intention of doing anything but writing recipes about what I made for dinner, or taking pictures of my garden, or my dog, or my cat, and um, and then things started happening. People liked my recipes, and I got good feedback. And there's nothing like good feedback to make you want to do more of it. Um, but when I really paid attention, the things I was getting feedback on were my canning recipes and my canning instructions. And I realized how hungry the general community was for solid, angst-free advice for canning. And canning is not difficult and the idea that you're going to kill your family is so overarching and so absurd. Um, at June well, Taylor, for some of us, not, not all of us. Some of us <laughs> are kind of loose with that idea, but not all of us. Right. <laughs> but I've, I've heard um, that June Taylor, who's the great jam maker in the San Francisco area, once said the only way that you can get hurt with jam is if I throw a jar at your head. And is that, I mean, really, jam, pickles, these are solid places to start. That much vinegar, that much sugar, you are just not going to hurt anybody. It's going to turn moldy first. You're going to know if that food is not good. When you go beyond jams and pickles, then you do have to be careful. 
but I believe that the um, the public is so terrified of canning that they need a voice that is not, and I'm trying to be that voice. Well, uh, Kathy, I have to tell you, I'm one of those people who's terrified. <laughs> I'm just convinced <laughs> that if I were to try it, I would like off everyone in my family. So could we maybe talk about a few safety tips? Like, would I really know if something were bad? Like, I kind of get the yes. idea that like it would be invisible, and I'd feed it to somebody, and they'd drop dead immediately, and I would have, would have no idea. I mean, how do I get over that? Um, first of all, use tested recipes. This is not um, like braising or like making a stew or a soup where you can say, I don't have a carrot, I'm going to add a beet. Um, you have to really do exactly what those recipes say. Process for the amount of time, in the size of the jar, don't change the ratios. You do all that, you're going to be safe. I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, I went to make the jam, and it looked like a lot of sugar, so I just didn't add all that sugar. And, yeah, it said lemon juice, but I only had an orange. Okay, right there, you have destroyed the chemistry that exists to make a good jam. You're not going to kill anybody, but you're not going to get a good set. You're not going to um, preserve the color, and it might not last for a year. When I make a jam, and I do it with those ratios that I've devised, I know that with a sealed jar, that jar is going to last on the shelf for a year without any trouble. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start messing around, you decide you're going to throw a couple of garlic cloves in, or you know maybe I'll have some mushrooms, or, or that great story of the, the NPR story about this man who um, he, he killed an elk in hunting season. He was in his 70s, I think. And he kind of remembered his mom used to can elk. So he went home and he butchered the elk. I don't even know how that happened. That's a big jar, let me just tell you. Right. You get that whole elk yeah, in exactly. the jar. And then he put all the elk meat in the jar. And then he started to can it. But it seemed like an awfully long time. So he didn't do it for the whole amount of time. And then... You know, if you talk to canners, you talk about the ping, this sound that the jar makes when it vacuum seals shut. Well, he heard those pings, but not when they sealed shut, but when they unsealed in his pantry. So when he heard that, he said, oh, it must be ready. Then he got it out of his pantry and ate it, and then he got botulism. So I don't even know how many things are wrong with that story. I'm not even sure where to start. But the rule is follow the recipes, do what they say, and you won't get hurt. I guess that's it. How's that? And, and there's this whole sterilization process with the jars, right? I'm always yeah. worried that I'm going to somehow mistakenly touch the inside of a jar by mistake. or. or... Um, let's change that word. Let's change that word to sanitize and not sterilize. Because sterilizing is like autoclave, brain surgery. Right, I feel like I need know? to scrub in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All, you know, you just want clean jars because who wants to put dirty things in a jar? But if you touch it on the inside, I'm assuming that your hands are washed. You know, it's not... So I think um, I, I sanitize all my jars in the dishwasher. It's super hot, and they just sit in there in the heat. You can also just put them into the canning kettle that you use to can the product. And if they sit in there for 10 minutes in boiling water, they're clean, and it's going to be fine. You know, there, was want... a similar, there was a similar discussion. Uh, uh, Michael Ruman on his blog kind of went off about a week and a half ago. About Wasn't that people's, great? People's paranoia about their food and how fearful they are for their food. And it's like, okay, listen, if you cook it the way it's supposed to be cooked, it'll be fine. Right. Stop fearing your food, you know? Canning is a science. Uh, you know, so you have to follow the rules in science. Right. That's just the canning part, the processing part, the part where you take a jar, you put it in boiling water, and then you take it out of boiling water. And if you think about it that way, that act, jar, boiling water, out of the boiling water, mm -hmm. it's not that scary. And so, you know, the real art is in making a great preserves and getting that gel just right and the pieces of fruit, tender and not tough, not too much sugar, the color is bright. That's the real art form. This canning part 
I call it like a little dance. You have to know these steps, and the more you do that dance, the more familiar you're going to be with it. And it gets easier to, to put the preserves in the jars, to get the lids on, to get it in the canning kettle. All of that just becomes like, a, like riding a bicycle, you know? It's an action that you get comfortable with. But um, if you touch the inside of the jar, if there's a little bit of food left on the rim, you know, you're supposed to wipe that carefully, you're going to learn that then your seal might not work. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't seal, you say, well, why didn't it seal? And then you have to learn clean it more carefully, be a little bit more precise. But those are just uh, techniques and skills that you learn the more you do it. So canning seems to be the thing that, that if people don't get it right the first time, they, they get frustrated and then they stop. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, well, I didn't do it absolutely immaculately. I didn't hear the ping. This is a lot of work. I'm not going to do this anymore. Boom, and it's over. And it's almost like when I think of canning, I think of like when people say, well, you're going to barbecue? Well, what does that mean? Are you going to do ribs? Are you going to smoke? Are you going to marinate? Are you going to do this? You know, there's all these different shades of it. When you yeah. just say canning and preserving, well, you might make jams or jellies. You might do, you know, preserve uh, vegetables or you might do sauces or something like that. Uh, there's so many different shades to it that kind of talking in a big umbrella way is, I don't know, it's, it right. doesn't really, it's not really as accurate as it could be. Exactly. I, yeah. I, think, um, I think the whole part about the canning itself uh, people get way too scared about. Like a lot of times, if you just can with uh, somebody who's done this before, if you do that once, you'll never be frightened again, Renee. Right. Okay. Come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> really, it, it really helps to work with a, um, somebody who has experience. Renee, put down your white wine, get in the car, and drive to Martha's Vineyard right now. I'm going really? to do it. <laughs> Turn right when you see a really grumpy guy in a painting, okay? Exactly. Uh, we, have a, we have a question. Jeff, let me get this question. In. We yeah, have yeah, a yeah. question in on Twitter from Kristen Begg Swider. She says, question, when canning stewed tomatoes, after canning them, they separated, the juice and the pulp separated. And she asks, is this because I didn't mash them enough? It Can is. Can you diagnose that? Yes. Um, first of all, the jar is just fine. It will, the liquid and the uh, pulp will separate readily. Shake it up, use it, you know, empty it. If there's nothing wrong with it. It'll hold for a, a year. Um, aesthetically, I call this a state fair question. Like, are you entering the state fair? If you're not, use those stewed tomatoes. Don't worry about it. But if you want it to be beautiful, and we all want to make beautiful food, what you need to do is as each quart of tomatoes is added to the pot, you need to smash them with a potato masher or something like that and bring it up to a full boil before you add the next quart. So every quart that goes in is still at a full boil as you add it. And that way, they're more incorporated and they won't separate in the jar. Oh, that's a great tip. Is there, um, if you're starting out doing this, um, is there a, a particular recipe on your site that, uh, and we're talking about mrswheelbarrow.com, is, is there a particular si uh, recipe that you would say is like a, a gateway uh, canning drug for, for people to uh, get hooked on it? Um, I think so. First of all, I have to say that I, I don't just can for the, like, to have these jars around. Everything that I can has to have some sort of purpose. Uh, I have recipes that are, are sort of intricately tied to mm -hmm. almost every recipe that I make, with the exception of apricot jam, because I just eat that. But um, the, on my site, there's a recipe for Asian plum sauce, and it's a nice spicy sauce made from the late season plums that are around right now, those dusky purple oval ones. And it's got ginger and garlic and chilies and coriander and mustard seed. And it's very complex and really fun and easy. And then um, if you just sear off a pork tenderloin or pork burger, it's like the best sauce in the world with pork. So there you go. Or you okay, can I am drooling right now. <laughs> that sounds so good. And you had me in plum sauce. I'm sorry. It, it literally, from start to finish, even canning, the whole thing takes an hour and 15 minutes. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, I'm down for that. There you I'm go. I'm absolutely down for that. Good. Um, have, uh, and I actually, more... I actually oh. oh, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Uh, we have uh, another question um, from Michelle Jenkins from the Daily Waffle. Hey, Michelle. Um, she asks, would you recommend using ball jars versus WEC, am I pronouncing that correctly, for mm -hmm. a beginning canner? She, she wonders if one is more foolproof than the other. Absolutely. Stick with the ball jars. I think the WEC jars are beautiful. They're also wildly expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can at any kind of uh, level, like regularly, every weekend, you are going to go broke using WEC jars. I know I'm probably going to get like in trouble for this, but um, I think they're beautiful. I keep a dozen WEC jars to use when I set the table at brunch or for my own personal use. Am I giving those away? No. I'm never giving them away. I mean, they're, three, they're too expensive. Ball jars are very reasonable and you'll find them everywhere. They're not only available at the big box stores and at the grocery store and the hardware store, but if you troll garage sales or the Goodwill or um, junk shops, I mean, they're everywhere and you can reuse them forever. And the size of the openings are consistent and have been for over a hundred years. So use the ball jars. They're so for somebody like me who has no idea what a weck jar is, what's a weck jar? Um, they're German. They're beautiful. They're all glass, and they have a glass top and a rubber ring and metal clips. And you can pr process in them. You can put them in the boiling water, and you know when they're ready when the rubber tips down. I mean, it's very um, subtle. And if you're a new canner, you really want that lid with the button in the middle that sucks down and vacuums and you're going to know for sure that that's um, sealed. So that's my advice. That's good advice. I'll probably um, never, get, yeah. never get a free WEC jar, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, right now you're, uh, the WEC Davidians are out burning your right. effigy in the front yard. <laughs> I'm in big um, trouble. Yeah, she's not getting off the vineyard. <laughs> the, um, uh, we, again, we want to uh, ask that uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, use the Kitchen Party hashtag, all one word, and a big giant pound sign in front of it uh, on Twitter. And, uh, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. I know I won't have the right answer, but Kathy will, so that'll be helpful. Um, Kathy, when, um, when you're... When you're making a batch or whatever you're making, how important is it? To uh oh. Uh oh. Out. When I was doing it for the first time, I realized, oh, I should probably have like a process, almost like a mise en place for canning. Like, there's, it, it helps to have one thing here and then one thing here, and then like have a flow instead of reaching all over the kitchen for something. How do you set up when you do your your process? I act. I really do consider this like a, a dance steps. Like the very mm -hmm. first thing I do is I get the big canner and I fill it with water and it goes on the stove and I start it boiling. I do that before I get even you know, get the food out or anything because it takes a heck of a long time to get that water to boil. And I just want it to boil once, then I turn it down and it's there. So that's the very first thing. And after that, you know, it depends what I'm making. I have certain pots that I like to use for pickling and others that I like to use for jam. And, um, but yes, I do think there is a mise en place. I think that you have to think that all through. Mm -hmm. You get the big pot of water, you get the jars in the dishwasher or in that pot if they're, they need to be sanitized, not sterilized. Sure. Um, and yeah, I have you know a little pot for the lids and rings and then my preserving pan. I usually have a baking sheet with a towel on it to hold the jars when I fill them and also to put them on when they come out of the hot uh, canning kettle. And then that baking sheet can be moved around because really you should leave the jars alone for about 12 hours so that they really seal and settle. Right. So, yes, mise en place. Wonderful. Well, over on uh, Google+, Plus, we have a couple comments I wanted to bring into the conversation. Michelle Jenkins said, that uh, she started uh, canning this summer and she started with strawberry jam and the key was to get a book and follow directions to the T and she says she's over her fear of canning so Renee take note. Okay Mitch. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you Renee, uh, I am coming out there and I'm going to can with you. <laughs> I, smell a, I smell a canning and preserving boot camp coming to LA sometimes. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Tamara DiCaprio says that she thinks she has some sort of addiction to canning jars. She literally 
literally will buy anything in a mason jar with a cute name. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm down with that. I think beer tastes better in a canning jar versus any other vessel. I know that there's some vessels built for beer. I don't care. I love drinking out of a ball jar. There's just something about it. I have a, a canning it's jar Like a jar obsession. like this? Like that. <laughs> so we have a tradition here where we drink out of uh, redneck uh, champagne glasses, which are the ball jars with the stem on them, you know. I love like those. The, the Duck Dynasty uh, jars. Yeah. Um, we also have, let's see here, we have more comments here. We have Deb Healing says that years ago when my grandmother passed, we found her handwritten recipes, and she was so excited that she finally had her secret book. But it was then I decided never to drink when I followed her directions because one of her canning foods that she used only for special occasion presentation was next to a bug bomb recipe on the same page. So uh, heirlooms can be dangerous, I think, is the method here. Um, oh, and then, you know, do What's we lose that? Kathy? I, I'm rolling, man. I'm not stopping now. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think we did lose her. She's on a, like a, like an iPad, I think. So you know how uh, unreliable. I'm sorry. Hey, and she's, she's it's back. a magic trick. It's him. He That's threw okay. me out. <laughs> we took a screen grab and we preserved your image, and then we used that while Perfect. you were gone. Put me in a mason jar. Right? Exactly. Um, Tamara DiCaprio also asks, what's the difference between canning, preserving, and pickling? I know this is basic, but I think there's a lot of confusion because people say, you know, I can that or I put that up, and, there, and there's a lot of different interchangeable uh, terms, and I wondered if you could cover that kind of uh, the ground rules there. I think that the overarching word is preserving because what you're doing is taking something fresh and holding it for later. And whether you water bath process, which is one mm -hmm. kind of canning, right. or steam pressure can, which is another kind of canning, or whether you ferment, which is another kind of preserving, or charcuterie, which is preserving, mm -hmm. cheese making, preserving. They're all just me you know, members of the same family. It's a way to take something fresh and hold it for later. Okay. That I hope that clears it up. Well, if it doesn't, I'll be gone in 30 minutes, so <laughs> <No>. whatever. <laughs> the opinions expressed are those of Kathy Barrow and are not a kitchen party LLC limited <laughs> PA. Some people um, may be having um, some problems. Uh, Beth uh, from the blog OMG Yummy um, says that she's listening. She can get sound, but she can't get the video uh, for some reason. So she can't see that we're all waving at her right now. Oh, hey Beth, hi sorry Beth. about that. <laughs> sorry Beth, about right that. now I am topless. I don't want to shock you, but it's absolutely true. <laughs> I have fluffy slippers on. <laughs> now that's scandalous. It is. Um, you know, it's I, I, the other thing about this is that that I think that it's part of that wave of things that came back, like um, like pressure cooking. And, and people started, it sort of jumped a generation or two, but now people are realizing that uh, there's some pretty ama amazing science involved in it. Um, if, if, if you don't have a grandmother and you don't have access to the Internet, what are your options? I mean, you, uh, there, there are books on the subject, obviously yours but, coming out. Mm, yes, and the Ball Blue Book of Preserving is really the Bible. I, everything you need to know is in that little slim paperback volume. Right. I mean the recipes might not be as contemporary or interesting um, as some that you'll find in newer books like Food in Jars is a lovely book. Marissa McClellan's book is really nice. Um, Saving the Season is Kevin West's new book that has some spectacular recipes in it. Um, I'm going to forget somebody so that now I'm going to feel bad but That's okay. um, but those two I love. I, I um, do use Christine Ferber's book, Mes Confitures, which is terrific, very French, with hardly any instructions in it. So don't right. go there looking for instructions um, <laughs> at all. And then there's an older book that came out, I think, in 2006 or seven, called Canning for a New Generation that is also very nice. You know, the other one I, I bumped into, the uh, the Lee brothers, who do all the books out of Charleston. Yeah. They, they talk a little bit about, about quick canning and, mm -hmm. uh, and refrigerator uh, preserving. Um, and I wondered if you could explain a little bit about what that is. Because it, it's a little less intimidating than boiling water and whatnot. I think that it's a great um, a way to, like, dip your toe into the art of making jam or making pickles mm -hmm. without uh, tendering the science part of it. 
but it doesn't really take care of how I'm going to eat strawberries in January. No, it's a it's definitely a short term uh, kind of uh, endeavor, I guess. I do I do really like a quick pickle though. I think that refrigerator pickles are fantastic, and mm -hmm. like today, you know, we left town for a week, and I had some things in in the garden and in the refrigerator yesterday, and I I just hate to see anything go to waste, so. There are like six jars of quick pickles in my refrigerator waiting for me when I get home. Um, Nevin Martell, who's a food writer in Washington, mm -hmm. coined the phrase quickles, and I've completely adopted that. Isn't that I wonderful? hope you stabbed him in the throat for that. Did you <laughs> yeah. No, but I will credit him at every opportunity. Okay. It's such okay. a great word, isn't it? Okay. I don't usually get violent about words, but that one, for some reason, just kind of hit me wrong, and I apologize to him and his family for <laughs> Threat, like threatening as trachea, but um, quickles. No, we won't. We won't be having any of that here. <laughs> Kathy, what's the name of his blog? I'd like to check that out. Um, I don't quickles. know. Quickles.com. Apparently, he writes. He writes uh, often with the Washington Post, and and in fact, recently did their Donut Wars pieces, which were really fun. Oh, that sounds nice. So when now, you get home, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry, I'm not accounting for the white wine. Go ahead. <laughs> When you get home from your trip, what will you do with those quick pickle items? How may, how might you incorporate them into dinner or lunch or what will you oh, do? Oh, you know, um, my husband's a vegetarian and he doesn't like pickles at all. Uh, but um, we eat a lot of vegetarian meals and I garnish with condiments and pickles and cured meats and the things that he's not really into. That's what I do with them. But the quickles particular, or quick pickles, sorry, Jeff. Um, one of my favorite ways to use them uh, is on tacos and burritos, like you know, quick pickled onions, oh. quick pickled tomatoes, quick pickled carrots, banh mi, you know, all of that. Also, on a plain grain salad, I'm not a big fan of grain salads, but I know mm -hmm. I should eat them more. So I, um, I put quick pickles all over grains because they make it more interesting for me. Now, when that, when you use the product that you have um, or that you've made, and you say so you go through all of your quickles, <laughs> sorry, um, do, you, do, you, do you reuse the jars? Do you reuse the tops, the lids? What do you what do you do? You reuse <clears throat> the jars can be reused uh -huh. for a very long time. Eventually, the glass will fatigue and they right. might crack or break or they'll chip. You know, things do happen. Those are but called I, crackles. Right, <laughs> but I reuse them for a long time. The flat lids you have to replace every time. The rings right. you can use over and over. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, well, I, I didn't plan on this, but it actually was a moment of serendipity. I actually bought a bunch of, of preserved items this week. I was on a, a farm tour with a bunch of chefs. And I swear to God, this is absolutely true. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you make these sort of things. I'm kind of throwing, it's almost like, you know, improv at you. So um, like Jeopardy I have, or something. Yeah, I have uh, a jar of fig preserves. Yes. Um, is there, what do you I'm, call a low acid vegetable? Fruit, I'm sorry. Billy? That's a, I don't know. What? <laughs> that's, a, that's a low acid fruit. Basically. Okay. And um, they're actually not recommended for canning. Okay. Without, well, I won't eat uh, this, so right, we'll just put very, this away. Without a very, very high level of acid added. So, uh, for instance, when I cook with lemon or with figs, I always add whole lemons. Right. Or added citric acid. Figs, yes. It, the ingredients, fig, pure cane sugar, pectin, and citric acid. Citric acid. You're, you're okay. good. You're good. Good to yeah. see you. Okay, I have Jeff, cherry... Jeff, you know what that's going to be really good on? A grilled blue cheese sandwich. Totally. Big and blue cheese. Mm -hmm. I need to go change my clothing. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm going to picture that when you make it. Now, my I also, Lord. I am living thing, on the wrong coast. The other thing I do with fig jam, so you uh -huh. can make like a focaccia uh -huh. and put caramelized onions and fennel and fig jam... That's pretty tasty. Yeah, Ooh, that's not bad. my turn to leave. <laughs> the, uh, the other one I found, uh, this is all from Hunsader Farms and Briggs in Florida, by the way. It's um, cherry butter. Ah, okay, butters. Butters are a great thing to do with fruit that is not perfect. 
Like if you want to make jams, you really want your, your fruit to be very pretty. If right. it's not that pretty, maybe the color isn't great or it's bruised so you have to cut a lot of parts out. Mm -hmm. Butters are um, completely pureed and then cooked down to a nice thickness. And they use less sugar often than others. And for people who don't know, we're, we're talking about butter in the larger sense, not the actual cream dairy, dairy. product. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, hence the pumpkin butter, which is really tough to get out of a cow. But pumpkin yes. butter, here's for the season. Okay. Pumpkin butter is not recommended for the home canner. Strike ever. three. Okay. And I'll tell you why. It's very dense. And the science of canning, the way it works, is you put your jars into that boiling water. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get the food in that jar, the center of it, to 212 degrees, which is the temperature of boiling water. Right. And... Pumpkin butter is so dense because pumpkin is so dense that they it's hard to um, evaluate and and make consistent a recommendation for how to properly process it. So as a home canner, please don't ever make pumpkin butter. Okay, well, I think we're we're heading towards the kitty the kitty I'm portion so of this. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I, I picked something obviously that was was something that was uh, a little bit. You're just uh, doing advanced. this to make me look bad or something. I am doing. not doing that on purpose, but I'm enjoying it anyway. The uh, pickled beets are the last one. Can you do pickled beets at home? Oh, you can. I love a pickled beet. Yes, but you cannot can beets without that pickling. Okay. In in a water bath canner, you right. can do it in a pressure canner, but that's a different thing. You need because again, it's a low acid uh, vegetable. Like the okay. fig is a low acid fruit. That acid has to do with their pH, not their flavor. So it's got a, a pH number that's um, requires modification with additional acids. So you must pickle. There you go. Well, this one, yeah, this one, the ingredients are beets, vinegar, water, pure cane sugar, salt, onions, and spices. So that I think sounds little, awesome. Look, there's a little more going on there than uh, uh, just straight up beets. So. Love a pickle. Uh, and you know when, you're, yeah. when you make a little room in that jar, throw uh -huh. a hard-boiled egg in there. I was going to do vodka, but if you say hard-boiled egg, I'll do a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going. I'm following your example. You mentioned vodka. Now I'm like obsessed. So yes, but that hard-boiled egg thing. I mean, I'm a good Jewish girl. My, that's what my grandmother used to do with her pickled beets. When there was room in the jar, you throw in some hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if we if anybody has any questions, uh, we're here in the last 15 minutes of the show. Uh, be sure to send them in on the kitchen party hashtag, and uh, and Kathy will answer them for you. So going into the holidays. Um, I guess you probably all all canned for the rest of the year, or do you, are there some things you do seasonally for the holidays that uh, that people can do? I do cranberry sauce. Okay. Yeah, um, and I like to add a little raspberry to it, so maybe two parts cranberry, one part raspberry, okay. and a little orange zest, some Ooh. lemon juice and sugar. Um, make it just like a regular jam, and when you put it in your jar, actually it gels up so nicely because cranberries have a lot of pectin. Mm -hmm. That if you miss that nice tubular cranberry sauce that always appeared in those bad Thanksgiving dinners, you can actually get it right out of the jar in a tube and okay. slice it. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, I, you know, I know that I noticed on the blog that you do uh, you do peppers. A lot now, of what peppers. Is, what is it you do with the peppers? Because it seems like um, there's a lot you could do because you have different levels of spiciness. I'm doing the the babette thing here. Um, uh, there's a lots of level of spices. It's it's very colorful and yes. vibrant, and uh, you know it seems like there's uh, there's a lot of potential there. How do you uh, how do you play with it? There's a terrific recipe on Food 52 for homemade rooster uh, sriracha, and so I started there, and I've been playing with that recipe a bit. And there's a new recipe I just put up on my blog last week mm -hmm. for a hot sauce. Um, so you get the hottest peppers you can find, basically. Whatever's out there. The red ones are definitely prettier when you right. make a hot sauce than green. And, um, and following the recipe on Food 52, I learned to brine those chili peppers overnight with some salt and some vinegar. And from there, I started playing with other flavor profiles. 
And if you've had some of these jerk marinades or the West Indian flavors, they add some fruit. So um, just this year, for the first time, I started adding some dried pineapple to the hot chili pepper slurry. And I cook it a little bit till everything softens up, add some mm -hmm. sugar or honey, um, dried pineapple, and then whir it in the blender till it's totally pureed, press it through a sieve till it's nice and smooth. And that's an awesome hot sauce. So that's fun. Now the immersion blender, I have one of those. Is that any help at all when you're doing this sort of thing? Yeah, that'll work pretty well. I mean, it takes a while. The, uh -huh. the big blender's faster. Okay. Because you just want to make it as smooth as possible and then push it through a, a fine sieve so you get a, a pourable hot sauce. And, and if you were to, say, roast the peppers a little bit, would that, uh, would that be any uh, addition to flavor? Yeah, you can char them or you can smoke them if you have a smoker. Wow, that sounds really good. Yeah, that sounds really good. I know I what I'm doing Saturday. Right over some grilled chicken. <laughs> right. Um, now, uh, quick pickling is easy for chili peppers. It's really fun. Um, I do have a recipe on the blog. You just okay. what the most important thing to remember if you're going to pickle whole chili peppers is to pierce them with a knife. So because they're impermeable, and if you just put them into a uh, brine of vinegar and water and some spices, nothing's going to get in there. So every pepper needs two or three little pierced holes with the end of a paring knife and then put it oops, put it in your um, brine and let it sit for about a week and then you have pickled jalapenos or serranos. That's, That's something you could do as a gift to somebody for the holidays too. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, the hothead in your life. Do you get the little um, snacking peppers where you are? That's what they're called in the Mid-Atlantic. They're yellow and orange and red. They're about this big. They're sweet. Those yeah. are really, those are really pretty in a big jar, um, in a big pickled jar. Yeah. Well, here in Florida, you know, peppers grow uh, grow pretty well. So you know, you yeah. get everything everything from the pekin and the ghost peppers to whatever you want to really grow here, and, and they do well in the environment here. So, so last or two weeks ago, we went out to dinner for our anniversary, and the chef at the Source in D.C. gave me a jar full of these peppers that are called Facing Heaven peppers, and they're the hot, hot, hot pepper that's used in traditional Szechuan cooking. Okay. I have never in my life tasted such a hot pepper. <laughs> I, uh, I plunged a paring knife in and then touched it to my tongue um, and then I ran around the house like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Um, and so I made hot sauce from that and I'm a little scared of it. I but would I'm be a, too if I were you. Yeah, I'm a little scared. He said it's called Facing Heaven because the peppers grow straight up on the plant, like they're facing... But he said the other thing is that you go, oh, my God, help me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you run like hell. Okay, right. Great. I wonder, do you know how, how they compare heat-wise to something like a ghost pepper or a habanero? I've never heard of that before. I, gotta check I that. had never heard of them either. I don't know, but I'm really, I'm really not sure what I'm going to do with this hot sauce. I mean, I smelled it, and, and my eyes wouldn't stop tearing for about an hour. It was really powerful. I had to send the dog out of the house. I was worried for him. <laughs> See, I have a theory that, you know, it's kind of like the banjo and the and the bagpipe where I think there's just one song they just play it differently. I think that they're just renaming and giving exotic names to the same yes. old peppers. <laughs> I think <Yeah>. so, too. <laughs> this is your yoga pepper. You go downward dog facing Saturn. <laughs> I like that name, though, facing heaven. That's nice. I do, yeah, too, that's and they're very pretty. They're really pretty. The um, so you talked a little bit about cranberry. Any other holiday foods that you can? Um, last you got pumpkin, year, obviously. Uh, I don't do anything with pumpkins. Um, right, right. Last November in the New York Times, I had a piece um, about canning whole seckle pears or halved seckle pears. Ooh. They're the ones that are about this big, yeah. and I did it in a pink peppercorn and vanilla bean syrup that was really lovely. Oh my god. Um, those were pretty good. Yeah. I'm that facing nice. heaven. <laughs> Thank wow. You. I yeah. wouldn't have thought the peppercorn and pear would have paired well, but I guess well, there's the name. Just the pink ones. You know, that really floral pink peppercorn right. flavor. Yeah. Which I don't think they're even really a peppercorn. There's something else. 
They're a rutabaga. I don't know. No, no. Um, there's some I want to throw in a question about charcuterie. How does that? How do you even do that? <laughs> I well, have, I'm so you take curious. a piece of meat and you just hang it up somewhere in your garage and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how I started. Um, but then I took a couple classes, and I don't know if you um, or, or saw the whole charcuterie palooza thing, which was just so much fun. But Kim Foster, who's on Twitter, and I mm -hmm. co uh, collaborated to start. Charcuta Palooza, which ran during 2011. Yeah, 2011. And we did a different um, charcuterie project every year, I mean, every month. And it was sort of an educational arc where we started simple and it got a lot more complicated. I would say, Renee, if you wanted to start charcuterie, the best thing to do is start by making bacon, which is so simple. And who doesn't love bacon? And then you're hooked. I mean, really, it's it's a drug. You have a little bit of that, and then you think, well, how hard could corned beef be? And the next thing you know, you're you got an eye around, and you're walking around your house looking for some place where it's 55 degrees. <laughs> then you're down on the corner at about three, and go, hey man, you got any duck roulette? You got any duck roulette? Come on, man. Exactly. I'm just trying to show me some duck, man. Drop me some duck. <laughs> Well, you know, in Florida, you know, there's just so much humidity here. I know charcuterie is a little tough to do, especially when you're doing sausages and things like that. Is there a is there a sort of humidity proof charcuterie that we could uh, we could try here? Because you know, I'm only interested in Florida. The rest of the world can go to hell. I understand. What I would do is I would do what I did: go on Craigslist and find right. yourself a wine refrigerator, one of those little ones that has a temperature on it on the outside. Right. I got mine for twenty-five dollars, and um, I hang everything in there. I've, I've made, you know, saucisson sèche, and I haven't done a prosciutto because it won't fit in there. But everything else, little hams. Um, that is brilliant. I'm going to go on Craigslist and look for one. Yeah. I love that. And the other thing is that you need to go to the hardware store and invest in something called a hygrometer, and that costs about eight dollars. And it's um, half thermometer and half humidi humidity meter. So then you just put that in your wine refrigerator, and it'll tell you if your humidity, you don't want it to go above like 75%. Um, if it goes high, put a bowl of rice in the bottom of the wine refrigerator, and it reduces the humidity. If it's low, put a bowl of water in there, and it increases it. So pretty straightforward. I figure people have been making charcuterie for, you know, hundreds, thousands, a long time without a refrigerator, without a hygrometer, without electricity, without, without a cook, wa Without right? wine. <laughs> they did it with salt and meat because they were going to yeah. be hungry when it was all gone. So I guess that's how I started. I didn't really worry that, I, I didn't worry that anything would go wrong that I couldn't see. And uh, Bob Del Grosso, who's a, a great teacher and a really marvelous charcutier, I, I called him once and I said, how will I know? Oh, I called him because the Washington Post was doing a story about me and I was going to serve pancetta to the editor. And I thought, oh my God, what if I kill her? <laughs> and so I, I called him and I said, how will I know? And he said, if you see mold and it's long and black and hairy, throw it out and don't feed it to her. So... That's my that's my rule of thumb. Long black hairy mold, don't eat it. <laughs> that that works for all foods, not just charcuterie. Kids. That's right. No. <laughs> um, that might just be your uncle Maury. It could be. <laughs> it could be. Um, we have uh, Deb Healing over on Google Plus says I purchased smoked garlic from an Amish farm near Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Um, can I can those to keep them longer? Normally, I just devour them by sm smearing them on a good semolina. Oh. I know. Everything, everything tonight is like, oh my god. <laughs> I know. I sound like such a party pooper. I really hate to be the canning police, but here's the thing. <laughs> Here's a new sitcom. <laughs> canning cop. Dun, 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 dun. Freeze! Put down that ball jar. Your storage is too warm. <laughs> I'm getting um, all too old for this. That's like the, a uh, The thing about garlic <laughs> and all foods in that group, which are called alliums, is yeah. that they happen to be one of the more virulent um, hosts for botulism. Good times. Yeah. So, no. The answer is no. 
That's why the Amish population isn't growing kids. They're all dying of botulism <laughs> garlic. Now, if you don't can it, you're fine. But if you put something like that in a in a environment, you know, right. like a canning environment, then yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, Could you possibly it. freeze it? Yes, absolutely. Freezing is a possibility. Okay, well, that works. That works. Yeah, botulism dies at 241 degrees, or in I mean, it's it lives in almost everything. There's like little spores, but if you put it in an airless environment, in uh, without freezing, you know, without it being below freezing, you're going to just create more. The spores just grow. That's what's dangerous about botulism, and it's you can't see it. Um, so pressure canning puts foods at 241 degrees or greater, and that's why certain foods, like low acid foods, like beets, green beans, corn, uh, some tomato things, some things with chilies, some things with onions. All have to be pressure can for that reason. Wonderful. Okay. And then another question from Tamara DiCaprio, who apparently is a font of canning and preserving questions. She says, if someone you don't know that well, you know, someone you meet at a bus station or something, or maybe someone uh, you do gifts you with some canning experiments, is there any way to tell if it's really safe to eat? Everything's really about trust on a certain level, isn't it, Kathy? It totally is. You know, I don't eat many things that people send to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I won't send you these black guy pea relish bars. Okay. It's really a bad Actually, do thing. Do people to say. send you a lot of stuff? They do. I mean, wow. So, yeah, I, I get, I get a lot. Uh huh. Yeah. What an honor. That's great. <laughs> it's very nice. Yes. She's like, gee, so, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> some things I'm very happy about. I mean, most jams and pickles, like I said, there's not much. But if somebody sends me something with any kind of questionable ingredient in it, no. Thank you for that lovely jar of irritable bowel that you sent me, but I'm going to be passing. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so is there anything on Martha's Vineyard you're going to uh, can while you're there? Um, I don't know. I haven't, you know, we just got I mean, like when you go on vacation, do you take your stuff with you? I don't take my stuff with me, but you'd be amazed okay. what I can manage to do without any equipment. But I have my book deadline is Monday, so I don't think so. I think I'll okay. be proofreading. It's a it's a writer's weekend then. It okay. is. So when does your book come out? Next next October. Okay. Well, you'll and have to come called, back and yes, and, and be on the show and talk about it. Mrs. Wheelbarrow's Practical Pantry, and it's a um, canning and pressure canning and charcuterie and cheese making and all kinds of recipes of what you can do with what you've made. Not to give too much away from the upcoming book next year, but uh, pressure canning, we didn't really talk about that much. No, we uh, didn't. That, that seems very um, young Frankenstein to me, like it's alive and there's lots of steam and things like that. Yeah, and it's you know a big piece of equipment and right. it's, yeah, it's, it's serious stuff, but I love it because there is nothing, nothing like having jars of chicken stock on the shelf. Like, I don't know how many times all those bags came flying out of the freezer and landed on my foot. You know, they're, they slip or they get a hole in them and you put them in the sink to defrost and it all runs down the sink. Yeah, I have jars now. I have quart jars and pint jars of chicken stock, beef stock, veal stock, ham stock, fish fumet. It's all, it's nice. And you mentioned uh, a, year, uh, a year date before. Is that generally... The benchmark for you that something lasts for on your shelf for a year? Yes. And for the most part, most things that you can are shelf stable for twelve months. Mm -hmm. And as how long do you get the ping? What? As long as you get the little ping. That's right. How do you do you have an organizational method for keeping track of all of that? Like what went in at a particular time of the year? Yes, I take a Sharpie and I write on the top of the jar. With the date. The That's old amazing. Sharpie method, just like our <laughs> ancestors used to do. <laughs> when they would go down to ye old Sharpie shop and pick up a Sharpie and go, I think I'm going to can for the winter. That's right. But the, the other thing, the reason I do that is I really don't like to label my jars. Right. Those labels are hard to wash off. They're just a pain. Um, sometimes I'll tie something on if I'm going to give it as a gift. But the other piece of advice I'd like to give all new canners is never write exactly what it is. Like, I don't write strawberry jam because if it doesn't really set and it's kind of loose, 
it's just strawberry syrup. So I just write strawberry, you know, like don't commit, strawberry. And whatever it is, it's just fine. <laughs> just start with this, straw. <laughs> Here's a big jar of straw. Exactly. Yeah, mom, just like mom used to make. You know, I, I'm, I know that one of the things that frustrates so many new canners is trying to make jam that will actually set and gel right. and look like smuckers. And it's hard to do. It's hard to do the first time. And that's why I just want everybody to be more relaxed. If it doesn't set up, it's still going to be delicious. Just put it on pancakes or stir it in your yogurt or whatever. Don't worry so much. Well, that's I great. Love that. Well, it's hard to believe it. We've been on for an hour, I, and I want to thank you. Why don't you tell people where they can find you and tell them a little bit about where you are online? Yeah, um, you can find me at uh, www.mrswheelbarrow.com. Also, Mrs. Wheelbarrow on Twitter and Mrs. Wheelbarrow's Kitchen on Facebook. And um, I'm often in the New York Times, Washington Post, and a few other places. Those old rags. Those old rags. <laughs> is there a Mr. Wheelbarrow, Mrs. Wheelbarrow? There is. My last name is, as you can see, it's actually Barrow, not Barrow. Ah. Um, and the reason I chose Mrs. Wheelbarrow is I was a landscape designer before I started blogging about food. And so it was my landscape design business name, Mrs. Wheelbarrow. That's I had a to great marry story. him. <laughs> It seems like it just works so well also for what you're doing now. It's perfect. I know. Who knew? I mean, Thank I God you didn't marry a guy you know, whose last name was Ho. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, you want to, uh, do you want to share with people where they can find you online in various places and publications, or are you just going to choke on your white one? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Renee Lynch uh, on Twitter, Facebook, a bunch of other places. Um, pretty much every day I'm at latimes.com. And we want to thank Babette Papai, who was not here tonight. She was uh, busy uh, filling the young skulls full of mush at USC with all kinds of intelligence about <laughs> multimedia and online and social and blah, 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 and harumph, harumph, harumph. And uh, we miss her very much, but she'll be back next week. And just remember, this is, uh, this is uh, the Kitchen Party Hangout that's put on by Bakespace.com and Cookbook Cafe, the app that's on iTunes that you can download and make your own homemade uh, cookbooks, uh, canning, without canning, whatever you want to do. It's your recipes. You can make it however you like. Kathy, thank you once again for joining really us. It's nice been a blast. Really nice to see you. Thanks. You've been a very patient person to put up with all my shenanigans and all my jokes and give my best to Mr. Grumpy and Mr. Wheelbarrow. <laughs> I certainly will. Thanks, Renee. It was nice seeing you. <laughs> nice all right, guys. You. Until next week, we'll be back next Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific, and we'll see you guys all then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> This is where we dance. She left. <laughs> That's a two-person dance party. No, I'm still here. Oh, there she is. Okay. You gotta dance. Listen, I gotta go. I've been awake since four o'clock in the morning. This is enough already. Bye, Kathy. Bye, bye. <laughs> to make it work. <laughs> it's the song that wouldn't end. <laughs>